cual desconoce la reelección de Díaz. La formación de un gobierno. Porfirio Díaz resigned the presidency and went into exile. Francisco de Madero. The Mexican Revolution. They escaped the revolution in, in Mexico. In recent decades, immigration has made its way to the top of many politicians' political agenda, particularly and if you don't have a strong border, regarding the U.S.-Mexico border, you don't have a country. In this interview with Dolores, daughter of two Mexican immigrants, we hear her and her family's story. My name is uh, Dolores Bruner, but my maiden name was Serna. I'm one of eight siblings. I was born in Torrington, Wyoming. My mother was from Sonora, the state of Sonora. My mother's parents were more business people. My grandmother would do the borders, but my father's family was all laborers and worked in the crops. I would say my mother's side of the family were immigrants. Anybody could cross the border at that time. That was in the early 1900s. My father's movement is much more interesting. They escaped. They were refugees. That's where my father family was completely different. They were aristocrats, the landowners. They had hacienda servants. So wait, if the Cerners had land and had wealth, why were they threatened to leave? Let's go back to the Mexican Revolution. The whole revolution started because of a dictatorship, Presidente Diaz. All the power was in the hands of a few. And that was kind of what spurred this, let's get this guy out of power and start distributing wealth. But they had to leave or be killed. Uh -huh. It made sense for someone who was in that higher class position to want to get out. It's interesting how they went from, it sounds like, pretty like high class, leaving everything behind and coming to a new country where they're looked down upon and having to start again. I mean, it shows the urgency of, exactly, yeah. of how much they felt like they needed to leave. I think both families just came into the States and knew nothing. I don't know how I would do it if I was thrown um, in another country. I don't know too many stories. Dad only told one, and I think the reason they didn't want to talk about about the horrible things they saw. Death was something they saw. They saw people hanging and trees and dead people. So you can understand why they didn't want to talk about it. Anyway, they were all very happy to be in the United States. When I was three months old, I had uncles and aunts that had migrated to the Yakima Valley. They contacted the rest of the family and said, come to Washington. We found the perfect place for all of us to live and we can get a lot of land. So we took off back to Washington. I also find it so fascinating to see what one family did after coming to America. And it just makes me ponder about all the other families who left Mexico as well. Makes these kind of stories feel more personal. And I feel like sometimes when we just hear statistics, it's hard to even feel that empathetic. Learning about this specific story was really effective and wonderful. It's actually funny because my grandma and grandpa, so grandma Dolores, they actually own an orchard. They did grow up farming too. My mom and her sisters, they all grew up on a farm. That was like kind of their second job. They actually recently sold their orchard, which is kind of sad, but um, oh. It is kind of cool to think about how they continued on the tradition of like agriculture. The other thing too was I was the only Mexican in town. Then I went to college and I realized that people could make fun of you by the color of your skin. That was a wall that I did not expect. Then, you know, okay, so kill them with kindness. You kind of overcome those things after a while. The laborers that came here, it was mainly just the men and they came seasonally. They didn't bring families. As some of them started bringing some family, then we worked really hard to convince them that they needed to stay here year round mm -hmm. for the children's sake, you know, as far as education. So now that's why when you come to the valley here, very large percentages Hispanic. That's kind of crazy to see that change. 
You grew up probably talking Spanish in your household. Our parents insisted that we learn English. They were also very cognizant of the fact that it could be a hindrance in that people might look down on us. So they made sure that we spoke English all the time, except maybe at home. She didn't really talk about this much in the interview, but I do know like my mom growing up and her sisters, my grandma didn't teach them Spanish because she just didn't feel like they needed to stand out. I, I was pretty bilingual. Like looking back, my grandma was like, why didn't I teach them? And that's totally something that I would have wanted to learn too. Like my mom was fluent and she could have taught me. They wanted us to be very American because they didn't want people making fun of us. And my mother and father, they taught themselves to read and write in English. And my mother learned by reading true story magazines, true romance. <laughs> I assume that my grandma's probably more proud of her ethnic background now. I have more of an appreciation of my ethnic background. I went to a school, we had Filipinos, Japanese, Germans, but we were all in agriculture. That was kind of the thing that bonded you. The advantage to all of this was we appreciated everyone. We learned to eat a lot of different foods. <laughs> we did, we did. As we all grew up, we had an uncle that was quite an activist. He fought for a lot of rights for Mexican people in Olympia. So he was very well known. He was an inspiration to the rest of us. How did you feel learning about your history? I totally think it's all awesome and I want to embrace everything. When I was little, it was all family related. You didn't need to go out and find friends. We had enough cousins, <laughs> but we'd get together on the weekends and There'd be baseball games and there'd be picnics and there'd be a lot of food. That was kind of the fun things. Sometimes we went into town and they would have big dances. Everybody went. You may be wondering, since we learned that Dolores owned land, she must have worked in agriculture, right? What made you want to go into teaching? Not exactly. Well, let's see. I was in second grade and I had said, I want to be a teacher. That was my goal. And of course, culture comes into this. My father was not really quite sure that I should go to college because, you know, girls were supposed to get married and have a family. My mother had a different thought. <laughs> No, she doesn't have to do that. It seems like your grandma had a good opportunity. My high school principal got me a full scholarship to the community college. He said, you have potential, you're gonna go to college. So I did, I became a teacher and I was very happy. I loved it, I loved it. 50 years ago, 50 years seems like a long time. <laughs> it, is. it is, and I'm a little older than you are. <laughs> Well, it's a melting pot because so many people came here to escape for a better life. They were seeking asylum and they were seeking safety in the U.S. Anything's better life knowing that they're not going to die or be killed or persecuted. I think about all those people who are trying to escape persecution and find asylum in the U.S. today are willing to make those same sacrifices. So we just have to learn to appreciate what other people went through to get us to where we are. And they come here because they're looking to stay alive.